we go. Ephesians 1, 11 through 14. You ready? Paul continues his thought. Furthermore, because we are united with Christ, we have received an inheritance from God. This means inheritance, I'm going to take my time reading this. Inheritance means what God has for us. Ultimately, the inheritance is eternal life, relationship with him. But how many know there are blessings? There is an inheritance that he gives us. The inheritance are his promises. The inheritance are the blessings, the benefits that come along with following him. And when we're united with him, we've received an inheritance from him. For he chose us in advance. And he makes everything work out according to his plan. Let's just pause right there because we're not going to come back to verse 11 after this. Um, But you just need to let that sink into your spirit today. Some people, you're facing things. You're you're in a a place of distress in your life right now. Not everybody, but some of you, you need to hear today that he, other translations would say predestined. That's a strong word, predestined. In the NLT, which we're reading today, it would say that he chose us in advance. The thought is that he all predetermined. I mean, before the earth earth is created, you have been in his mind and his heart. God stands outside of time. He's alpha, omega at the same time. And so you just have to understand that you've already been chosen. God's already worked it out. God's already, he's got the the plan. He already had the plan of forgiveness before we ever committed our first sin. He has the breakthrough already. Even if you have a mountain in front of you, you need to hear today, he makes everything work out according to his plan. And if you don't know his plan, it's not to harm you, but it's a good plan to give you a hope and a future. And so if you feel like you're walking through hell, just keep going, keep being faithful, keep moving, because God's working on your behalf. We need to I need to hear that today and and, and hear what Paul is writing. He's saying he makes everything work out according to his plan. He's got it. He's in control. Somebody say amen. He goes on to say God's purposes, or God's purpose was that we Jews, so Paul is is writing as um, a Jew, and he's saying who were the first to trust in Christ would bring praise and glory to God. God's purpose was that we would bring praise and glory and glory to God. Verse 13, and now you Gentiles have also heard the truth, the good news, that God saves you. And when you believed in Christ, and here's for these next couple of verses, the second half of 13 into 14 is where we're going to spend our time today. When you believed in Christ. Come on, if you're here today and you believe in Christ, this is going to apply to you, that you need to hear this today. If you don't believe in Christ, you're invited into the best relationship that you could ever be in, and that's surrendering your life to the lordship of Jesus. But for those that believe in Christ, he identified you as his own by giving you the Holy Spirit whom he promised long ago. And the spirit, the spirit that we have, everybody inside of us, Spirit that's in this room because we're gathered in his name, the spirit that we're singing about in worship, that spirit listen to this, is God's guarantee that he will give us the inheritance he promised and that he has purchased us to be his own people. And he did this, here it is again, so we would praise and glorify him. So we're just going to talk today about some of the things here that Paul says that we get to partake in, that, that we receive when we believe in Christ through the Spirit. So we believe in Christ. He gives us his Holy Spirit. And because he's given us his Holy Spirit, there are some things you can expect. There are some things that are true about you that you need to understand today. And and Paul is is writing this to these believers. I mean, these new Christians, this new, this church that has been formed, and he's encouraging them in these things. And, and so we're going to receive these things today. Um, and and it, so it's three points because that's what makes a good proper message, right? Um, but, but really, when you look at it, there's three things here that the Spirit gives. And the first thing is this, a guarantee of his promises. There's an interesting line here that will just encourage you today. It'll give you confidence today. Um, and you need to understand that the Spirit of God that's been given in the NLT has translated his guarantee. Uh, this word also means um, a seal, which in that day and age would make a lot more sense, a wax seal that is sealing, showing who it's from, showing that this is authentic, showing that it's real, showing that you can trust it. Another word that's translated from this Greek word for guarantee is the word deposit. 
And, and if you think financially, this is, this is the, literally, this is the meaning of the word, the word for deposit as if I'm going to put down a deposit or I'm going to put down, ready, a down payment. If you put down a, a, a 20% down payment on your house, I mean, that's a good chunk of change. And when you put down that down payment, what are you doing? You're telling the bank, I'm not going to walk away from my obligation to repay the other 80% that you're going to loan me for this loan. I'm not going to walk away from that and leave you hanging because I have skin in the game. I have 20% in the game. I have a, a deposit there. I have, I have a down payment there. When you put a, a deposit down for something before you pay it in full, what you're saying is if I walk away, I, I lose something because I'm invested into this. And here's the wording, you ready? Is that the spirit of God has been put in us as a deposit, as a guarantee, as a down payment from God to say, I'm not walking away from you. I'm in you. I've invested into you. I, I've poured into you. God's poured himself out. The spirit of God, one of the three expressions, one of the three persons of the Trinity, he's three in one, one in three. God is, is, is the spirit of God is God, and he's put himself in us. Paul says to the Ephesians as a deposit. The proof that God's going to come through, the proof that you're going to make it through is that his spirit's in you. His Spirit's here today. His, those that have been filled with the Holy Spirit, you've seen the Spirit move. It's undeniable that God is in you. It's undeniable that God is working. How I many know sometimes we don't, you know, we don't feel the Spirit sometimes, and we don't live by feeling, and sometimes we don't have goosebumps. I'm not talking about feelings. I'm not talking about goosebumps. I'm talking about the undeniable presence of God in your life, that if you follow Jesus, have the Spirit of God in you, you know, you've seen his faithfulness, you've seen him work, you hear him speak, you, you feel him in your life and in your family, you've, you've experienced his faithfulness, that's his guarantee. Don't think I'm going to stop now. Don't think I'm going to let you down now. I have you. I'm, I'm holding you. I, I, I've invested in, in you, and I'm not going to walk away from you. I'm going to do what I've said I'm going to do. When you believe in Christ, the Spirit gives you a guarantee of his promises. The second thing that the Spirit gives you, according to Paul, is a new identity. And now, I know that this seems very basic, to you, if you're a Christian and if you have grown up in church, you know that you have a new identity. But let's talk for a moment about the original audience here and the culture that he was writing into. And, and, then, and then it might mean something more to you. He says in verse 13, he identified you as his own. He identified you as his own when you believed in Christ. Your identity changed. And now here's what you need to know. The original audience had an issue here, a, a, a cultural issue, because they didn't originally belong to God, and in this culture, the way that you would worship, so what your religion was and what gods, lowercase g, gods, or idols, you would deities that you would worship, depended on what family you came from. So you would worship based off of your family. This was a huge deal to these pagan families. Whoever you, where, whatever your parents worshipped, you worshipped. You worshipped based on family origin. The worship of gods was a family affair. Whatever the, your family did, that's what you did. It was passed down from generation, and worshiping a new God would be unfathomable to the people of this time unless you had a family basis to do so. It, it was worship was connected to family. And so, what Paul is saying, he's going after that issue. That's why you can't miss it. They just say new identity. And he's going after that issue. He's saying you identify with your family of origin, but once you believe in Christ, there is a new identity that trumps that. This is the identity of Christ. You've been placed into a new family of origin, and that family, the family of God, is going to inform your worship. And there is only one God, Yahweh God. That's the capital G God. God, the one true God, and this is now the God you worship because you're a part of a new family. Church, you are a part of the family of God, citizen of heaven above all else. Thank God for your family of origin. For some of you, you might not say thank God for my family because you have had a bad and painful experience with your family, but 
Thank God for our family of origin. Thank God for all the different, the cultures and the way we grew up. And that's what makes us beautiful, a tapestry of people that have come together that are not the same, that don't look the same, that didn't grow up the same, but we've been born into the family of God. The language used in scripture is that we've been born again. So it's like you're born all over again, a spiritual birth, and you're born into the family of God. And this seed is not a corrupted seed. This seed came from the Holy Spirit into Mary with no sin, yet with all humanity. And in a beautiful mystery, Christ was born. And Christ says, you're now the children. You're my children. You're my sons. You're my daughters. And he's placed his spirit in us. And now we have the image of God in us. We have God's spirit in us. We have a completely new identity, and it changes everything that we do, starting with our worship. And so now everything is subservient to that. Everything comes under the authority of God, what we value, what we ascribe worth to, what we spend time and money and attention on, what we let into our lives, what we keep out of our lives, the boundaries that we draw. It, it's not our family origin. It all flows from him. There are things in your family that you don't want to continue. You need to know you're not going to be able to discontinue those with willpower. You've got to have a renewing of your mind. You have to be regenerated in your spirit and to say that I am not even, I don't have to do it by my willpower. I am a new creation in Christ. And so it's not by my willpower. It's that it's his power in me. I am a new person. Your dad, your grandfather was an alcoholic. Divorce runs in your family. Listen, you're a part of a new family. You don't have to be a slave to that. You don't have to say, well, that's just, it's inevitable in my family. It's only a matter of time for me. No, no, you're a part of a new family. Not by willpower. You're just not that anymore. Can somebody say amen? You've been given a new identity. You're a child of God. And that informs our priorities, informs our worship, it informs our actions which leads two and three really go together uh, because it leads to point three, which is when when you believe in Christ, the Spirit gives you a purpose beyond me. Uh, The the Spirit gives you a purpose that's bigger than you, a a, a purpose that is not about you. And so I just want to spend a little bit of time on this, and then then we'll close, that, that we have to understand this today. For us to be salt and light, that's our theme this year, that's what... Jesus said in Matthew 5, salt, preserve the good in the world. Light, shine in the darkness. We, if we're going to do that, we have to understand what Pastor Tony talked about, what we try to talk about a lot around here, and it is so countercultural that, listen, life's not about you. And most people know that, but then you come into church and you spiritualize selfishness by making church about you what your style is, what your preferences are. And yeah, we all have, there's a style to every church and their preferences, every church, and that's what makes the Capital C Church an amazing thing because you can find a local body that does fit you. That's fine. But listen, let's not let our Christianity, our faith become so consumeristic that we think that this is what God's doing for us. When the Spirit is deposited in you, he gave you a purpose that is not about you. you you're, it's, it's not about, it, worship's not about you. Life's not about you. You know what it is, it is about? And we see it in verse 14. He did this so we would. This is the purpose. Praise and glorify him. Praising him, worshiping him, not just in song, which song is very important, the worship and song, but with our lives, that's your purpose. We tell our kids as much as we possibly can. What were, you, what were you made for? What were you created for? Rayleigh would tell you. She's in here right now. She'd tell you that we asked them that, and what's the answer? The answer is to worship God. The best thing you can do for your kids, parents, listen to me. The best thing you can do is start there. What are you created for? To worship God. Why did God make you? To worship and glorify him. Do you know? And that's, I'm saying teach your kids that, but I'm saying there's a lot of adults that don't know that. 
They don't act like that. They haven't, they haven't really gotten a revelation of that. Do you know how many issues would be solved if we realized that my faith is not about what God can give me and how God can bless me and how God can make my life better and give me my breakthrough? Do you realize how many things would be solved if we got our attention off of me and we said that God has saved me and to, in order to glorify him in the earth? And this is what Paul is saying, your purpose, the Jews' purpose is to praise and glorify God. Gentiles, those that have been grafted in by the blood of Christ, you've been brought in, guess what your purpose is? to praise and glorify him. Our purpose as the body of Christ is to praise and glorify God. This is our primary purpose. Everything else flows from what and slash who we worship. It's clear in scripture that the ultimate purpose given from God is not the happiness of believers, but the glory of God. The, the point of your life, if you came here to hear a God is going to make me happy message, you came to the wrong place because the Bible doesn't say it. The Bible says that we're blessed. That, that's, that term, that word blessed is a very rich word. That does mean satisfied. It does mean that there's joy. That does mean that we're blessed. But, but the Bible doesn't say that we are going to be happy. In fact, Jesus kind of tries to scare people away oftentimes, I think, because he's trying to make sure our expectations are set. <laughs> In this world, there's going to be trouble. Hey, but take courage. I've overcome the world. But you're not here so that you can't experience trouble. We're, we're, gonna, we're headed for a place where there's going to be no more trouble. But we got to take as many people with us there as we go. We can't get selfish. We can't get about our own comfort and our own preference. we got to have a, a purpose that says, my life is meant to glorify God. The irony is, I wrote it like this in my notes, the irony is when you chase happiness, it will escape you. But when you chase purpose, happiness often follows. And so when you live to deny self and glorify God, a lot of issues are solved as a byproduct. It makes sense when you learn this. We don't, we don't chase after the, the fruit of the Spirit. We don't even chase after the gifts of the Spirit. Although we believe in the fruit of the Spirit. We believe that the, 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 the fruit is the byproduct of a Spirit-filled life. We believe in the gifts of the Spirit and that they're active today. And, and we believe that the Spirit of God is working through us. But we don't chase the gifts. We don't chase the fruit. We don't chase after those things. We, we chase Jesus. We glorify Jesus. All of those are meant to bring glory and honor to Jesus. And so when you learn that my life is, is meant, if I came here for nothing else today, you shown up to church to be reminded that your life is not about you, that your life is meant to glorify God. When, when you learn this, you can, watch this, you, everything flows. Your love, you can love people with no strings attached. You can love people the right way. You can love not to be loved back. You cannot just love the lovable. You can love sinners. You, you can love people who are not like you. You can love agape love when you worship God because when you worship God, he's magnified and God is love. And so you get a picture of love. And so then it's easy to love people when otherwise it wouldn't be easy to love people if you're self-centered. If I'm walking around church and walking around my life trying to get my preferences, you know, and, and, and make it about me, then you can't love people the right way because it's about you. You get your eyes on Jesus, you can love people the right way. You see how this works? You can forgive people that you don't feel like are deserving of your forgiveness when you get your eyes on Christ because as you set your eyes on Christ, you see the one who forgave all of us when none of us deserved it. So it becomes easier to be able to forgive because my eyes are on Christ, not on me and what I deserve. And I deserve an apology and I shouldn't forgive. I, I shouldn't have to forgive until they apologize. No, get your eyes on Jesus. Every, do you see this? Everything else begins to fall in, in line. We get order and morals because it's not about me. And this is why the worship of God is so important for the church and that we make the worship of God our primary purpose and priority because we realize it's not about me. And so I take the word of God and I let it create boundaries and, and order and morals and law in, in our world because it's for my good. And so I'm worshiping God and I know that his way is best instead of, well, how does this affect me? How does this restrict me? You see how this all falls into place? Worshiping God is most important. Joy comes because of it. Peace comes because of it. When I realize that life isn't about me. You, you become 
This is why it's so important that we understand this and that we live this out because culture flows downstream from worship. Okay, I'm going to give you this thought, and and we're going to close here in in a minute. We're going to pray and have some time of ministry, but culture flows downstream from worship. How many want to be salt and light in the world? That's that's a question. That was an easy question. That was a lob. You know, everybody's supposed to raise your hand. How many want to affect the world, you know, make a difference? See people's lives change, you know, see our community transformed and our city transformed. Culture flows from downstream from what we worship. Just a little etymology, Latin word for culture, you get the word cult. And when we hear cult, we think bad, of course. Um, but the, but, but at, at its essence, at its core, the word cult is worship, the word worship. And so cults are people that all worship, right? And you have all kinds of evil and bad cults. But really, the, we're talking about the etymology of this word, this Latin word for culture. It comes down to cult, which really means worship. And so then if you think about culture, so this is the world around us and the culture that we live in, you, you can see in different cultures that their culture is formed by what they worship. And you might say, what, what does that mean, worship? Like praise and worship? Like songs? No, what they ascribe worth to. Do you know that the word worship means ascribe worth to? So when we ascribe worth to something or value to something, that is worshiping. When we're lifting our hands and singing songs, we are ascribing worth and value to God. We're saying, God, you're more valuable than what I feel like right now. I'm going to worship you on Sunday morning. I'm going to give you praise, not by how I feel, but because of who you are, because you're worthy of it. I'm ascribing worth to you because that's who you are. Worship is ascribing worth to and value. And so you can look at cultures. You can go to a culture that, is a food culture. You go to New Orleans and see food, and you know that they love food. They ascribe worth and value to food. You know, you go to Nashville and see that it's a music culture. Why? Because they love their music. They, because their culture is going to be developed by what they value, what they ascribe worth to. And so whatever you worship, you become like. I heard it said, what we revere, we resemble, either for ruin or restoration. And T. Wright says, you become like what you worship. When you gaze in awe, admiration, and wonder at something or someone, you begin to take on something of the character of the object of your worship. The word of God says in Psalm 115, and the band can actually come because I'm going to close in a moment. 115 verse 8 says, those who make idols will be just like them, and so will all who trust in them. Idols is what we worship. When you make an idol, you're going to become like what you worship. 2 Corinthians 3, but we all with unveiled face beholding, watch this, this is Paul, as a, in a mirror, the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the spirit of the Lord. When, when we behold God's glory, when we worship God, when we get our face before his face, we become more and more like him. If we want, listen, this is what I'm, this is what I'm trying to tell you. If we want to change the world, we have to realize that our primary purpose is to glorify God. That's why I'm saying tell your kids. That's why I'm saying this. we got to come back to this simple truth. It's just not about me. It's all about him. Let my life be poured out as an offering, as worship to him. There's a lot of other things to do that flow from that. We've got to feed the poor. We've got to take care of people. We've got to serve people. But let us never make those things the goal. We as a church, we believe in justice, we believe in social justice, we believe in serving our community, but we're not a we're not about that stuff. We're about one thing. That's Jesus. And then everything can take its proper place. Then we don't make idols of social justice. Then we don't we start forming our belief systems like that's the God. No, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is God. It's all about Jesus. And then everything else takes its place. When you, when you, and you look around at our culture, and this is just to help you. I don't, I'm not talking, I'm not the preacher. I've told you this before. That's like, you know, on a soapbox, t- just condemning things. But let's, let's speak the truth in love and let's be mature Christians that can look around and understand what's going on. You get our culture, you see a culture of people in America specifically, but this is human nature. But more and more, we worship ourselves. Do you, do you understand? 
we, we want what's good for us, what's best for us, what's fastest for us, what's most convenient to us, what's the most profitable to us. And so we worship ourselves. When you worship yourself, you get more of yourself, and yourself is not good. And so what, what our post-Christian secular culture will say is you're good on the inside, and everything else is just trying to push you down, keep you down. But you need to let you come out. Listen, we don't want us to come out. The Bible says, I am crucified with Christ, and now Christ is alive in me. Do you see the difference in what we believe and what secular culture will tell you is that I'm not good, so I actually need to deny me, crucify me, and let Christ come alive in me. We're in, right now, in June, we're in Pride Month. It's all around us, in our faces. Let me tell you very loud and clear as a church that we love people that are struggling with every sin. And not only LGBTQ+, et cetera, not only is that sinful, th there, are, there are Christians that are in extramarital relationships, pornography, cheating on your spouse, emotional affairs. It's all sin. And so I'm not just pointing at one thing, but I'm saying Pride Month is incompatible with the gospel. Because I'm not, I'm humble. It's not about me. I'm not right. I'm wicked inside. And what culture is trying to say is anything in you, wicked, you know, whatever it is, and it is wicked and evil and sinful, and some of the stuff that's happening is demonic as our children are being attacked, and they're going after, the enemy is going after children in all types of ways. And as we look at that, at the core of it all, it's pride. It's I'm right, and anything that tells me I'm wrong is hateful, canceled, done, get out of my way. It's a destructive, demonic force, but Jesus has already defeated it. And he came, and this is how he defeated it. You ready for this? You ready for this? Jesus came and defeated it with this spirit. And this is what makes it, this is what keeps our tone right. This is what keeps the love in it. This is what keeps us theologically and spiritually centered as we can also speak truth. Here's what keeps us centered. Jesus came and defeated it with this spirit. Not my will, but yours be done. With this spirit. You ready for this? I came not to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom. The thing about real spirit-filled Bible-believing Christians, not the judgmental ones and not the ones that flip-flop on issues and won't take a stand. I'm talking about just Bible-based, spirit-filled Christians. Here's what a spirit-filled Christian will say, is I don't agree with you, but I love you and I'll serve you. I'll wash your feet. I'll do whatever. I'll, I'm going to serve you. I'm going to love you. I'm going to be kind to you, but I'm going to speak truth to you, and I'm not wavering, and you can cancel me. You can call me hateful. You can call me bigoted, but I stand on the truth of God's word, and if I love my, my culture, if I love my city, if I love my area, if I love my nation, I'm going to stand on the morals of God. I'm going to stand on the word of God. I'm going to stand on the truth of God. I'm not going to move. I'm not going to be hateful, but I'm just not going to move. I'm going to speak the truth in love because that's what Jesus did. That's what Jesus did. And so, so everything flows from what we worship. Let us never be the church who wants to preach Jesus, but we're actually living just a spiritualized version of what the world is doing. Just selfish Christians. There, the, there's no difference in a selfish non-Christian and a selfish Christian. Either way, your flesh is in the way. Either in the name of religion or in the name of sin. But either way, it's sin. And it's opposed to the gospel. The gospel says, I am crucified with Christ. And now Christ is alive in me. And so today, here's our response. It's very much like last week's response. Our response to the first part of Ephesians 1, as Paul is laying out these amazing, glorious truths, our response response is this. You ready? Worship. God, have my life. Have my life. And so this is what I wanted to do. The team, I've got the team back up here, and we've got a couple of minutes set aside. You don't need to rush out. We're not over time. We've got a couple of minutes here to just give our lives to God. 
back to God. Maybe you've just been a little selfish lately. It's time to, to lay your life back down again. Say, God, here I am. Let my life be laid down for your glory. I want to worship you.